Welcome, everybody, to the Fred Minnick Show's third season. This season, I'm going to shake it up a little bit and bring in some of my favorite people in the world of whiskey to co-host. Hang out and shoot the shit before we pull up the interview. He's known as the Bourbon Sherpa on social media. He's the owner of the Woodford Hotel. He loves Kentucky through and through. My boy, Eric Carrico, and the master distiller from Michter's, Dan McKee. This boy knows more about hard rock than a lot of us have forgotten. Then there's my really good friend, Jamar Mack. Jamar is one of the most influential bourbon personalities in the world. He's been going at the service and hospitality industry for 20 years. He founded the Kentucky Original Black Bourbon Enthusiast. Today, my co-host and I are all gathered for our guest I interviewed at his own winery in Arizona. Now, you may know him as the lead singer for Pucifer, A Perfect Circle, and of course, Tool. That's Maynard James Keenan. Before we head over to Maynard, think of every episode as a great conversation, and every conversation needs a great drink. And I'm excited to turn this over to the man behind the stick, my boy Dallas White, who's gonna make us a special cocktail. Check it out. The Fort Nelson Crusta. The Fort Nelson Crusta is a cocktail that it looks like you have to be a professional bartender to make. And there are two ingredients I really want to call out here. You've got the honey syrup. I love honey syrup. Anything to do with honey, I'm a big fan of. And yellow chartreuse. I sip on yellow chartreuse all by itself. But the Creole bitters, that could be what puts this over the top. This cocktail is so delicious. The Fort Nelson Crusta. Well, hey, how about it for, for Dallas here, man? Yeah, cheers. 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 Thank Thanks, cheers. Dallas. Really good. Cheers. Tool didn't allow their stuff on Apple Music and all those streaming platforms for a long time. And my first guest uh, on the new format of the Fred Minnick Show is Maynard James Keenan. I know you're a big fan yeah. of Tool. You know, just watching videos like I used to, and, and, and you were like, what the hell's going on? Because it like set a whole new trend. and But just the music itself, and you know, everybody listens to music differently, and I just love absorbing all the, you know, whether it's the music, the, you know, the lyrics, and so forth, and the, and really the creativity. Do we hear a couple of lyrics from you? <laughs> like, no, 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 I mean, seriously, I'd love to hear it. Just like, you, you just mentioned lyrics um, and favorite, like, uh, just give me, give Yeah, me. I, singing isn't my strong suit. No, 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 no just, I, I, I appreciate I, that. I, I wanted to feel that 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 tone. I don't you. think the world's ready for it. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> Subscription service. <laughs> yeah. That zone is only yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Yes. I can distinctly remember when I was at probably thirteen or fourteen. I had the Walkman where you hear like the the foam. The, the foam, yeah. Yeah, the foam. And like uh, listening to Tool and just listening to it over and over and singing it at night except it was like at midnight and I was singing uh, Prison Sex, which is not probably appropriate. And my dad yelling, shut the hell up. What are you talking about? <laughs> That's when your dad regretted <laughs> having yeah. you. He's like, what are you, what are you listening to? And I was like, nothing, dad. <laughs> yeah. It's this band called Tool. Yeah. <laughs> I was listening, so when I was 13, I was listening to Easy e and I got in trouble all the time. It's a whole, whole different genre, but man that time when you're when you're young you listen to your music and uh your parents interfere that sucks <laughs> yeah. that sucks cause you don't get me dad yeah. you don't get me no. mom I, I remember i turned up the home stereo that i saved all my money to to buy like this pioneer system with huge 15 inch woofers i turned acdc all the way up and it knocked a, a a very large picture frame off the wall and it fell down onto this very nice piece of wood serving station for my mom and it put a crease across it and i was like yeah let's yeah. just say i, I ran out the back action. door because yeah you know the first concert i went to was acdc was it really yeah i was in fourth grade wow wow again getting yeah, to know you yeah van halen sammy hagar was my first journey one. was mine nice yeah. journey was my first concert what's your first concert mine was crisscross what? Yeah. Doctors yeah. <laughs> yeah. and all. Sweet. Global Gardens. Like, okay. Wow. Yeah. 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 So, I He's the so talented. Yeah. 
you all are very important to me in your in your own way. But Jamar, we we actually haven't seen each other in a long time. You look really good right I now. I appreciate it. It has definitely been some time. Uh, very happy to see your progression and where you are. And I'm always grateful for uh, the platform and for the invitation to uh, share a board. I love your glasses. Thank you, sir. And I, I can't think of a better guest for me to bring on to the show because I was chasing Maynard for five years. Five years I've been chasing him. And there's a lot of mutual friends and connections uh, to get him, uh, to get to him uh, because of my music ties. And I've just found him fascinating because he's a winemaker. But for me, more importantly, he makes mead. And I wrote a book about mead that, by the way, nobody read. And I know none of you read it. Um, <laughs> But it's like, it was my only book to get reviewed by the New York Times. It's my worst selling book. But I, it, was, it was a passion project because I love honey and I love the, the process and the history of mead, which is essentially just, you know, fermented honey. And he is one of the best mead makers in this country at an industrial level. He does canned mead. We, talk, we taste it and we talk about it on the show. We also had about seven other products to include a yeah. Michter's, a Michter's 10 year old rye. And uh, just, just a hell of a time to sit down with one of my music idols. So watch the interview with Maynard. We're gonna be back with these, with these three here. <laughs> and who knows what's gonna happen. We're probably gonna have two or three cocktails in between. But uh, I'm sure we're gonna find something else about Eric in a moment. So cheers. <laughs> And joining the Fred Minnick Show, uh, Maynard James Keenan. Great to have you. It's good to see you, man, in person. We've done some stuff on uh, on Zoom. On the and interweb. we're uh, the interwebs, you know, over COVID as we did everything on the Zoom back in the day. Tell it, So we're, we're here at uh, at a new facility you're constructing. Tell us, what, what, what are you doing? What's cooking here? Uh, we had a facility. still have it out in Camp Verde. Uh, that's the main one that we were doing a lot of the Merkin and 4-8 wines. Yeah. At, but I should make all the caduceus up on the hill in Jerome. Mm. But uh, it's a bit of a drive out there and not very pretty. Uh, so I've reconstructed a whole winery here too, actually on site. So this is now the new uh, second location for the caduceus cellars mm. and Merkin Vineyards and the Fort Wineworks is made here and as well as the Pussifer wines. Just walking in here reminds me of like uh, Argentina. Uh, Argentina, parts of, uh, parts of Piemonte. So back in the day, before I took on whiskey writing, I was I, I was uh, I was a wine writer. Mm. I would do, I was doing wine and whiskey at the same time. And in 2006 to 2012, there was not a lot of demand for whiskey writing, so I, I was uh, always writing about wine. And I, I wrote for Small A Journal, Tasting Panel, Wine Enthusiast, Wine Spectator. So like all those you know major publications back in the day, and. I, it, for me, like it's been, I'm so far removed. It's so fun for me to sit down and, you know, last night I was in one of your tasting rooms and I tasted through your, through your wine. It was just, it was so fun for me because you have such, such diversity in, in your grapes, your, your, um, your wine making. And, uh, probably one of my favorite things is how you, uh, how you label, um, uh, your, uh, similar to port. I, I think you, I think you referred to it as not port or on the menu it says like not port uh, port style or mm -hmm. something like that and i was like that's a man who respects you know geographical uh you know the geography of, of people who are making stuff out there that was great by the way very very sweet very rich but also a lot of uh, a lot of almond characteristic to it I, I loved it my favorite that i had was this one the uh the sancha tell tell me about this one uh, Tempranillo is uh, one of those grapes in Arizona that's very generous mm -hmm. as far as farming it. Uh, it's kind of resilient to the crazy monsoons we have here. Uh, but because of the elevation, it's giving us a slightly more elegant version yeah. of a Tempranillo than you would normally find, say, out of California. It had some nice peppery to it, reminding me of some of the uh, Spanish Tempranillos that, mm -hmm. uh, from, from back in the day uh, that I had. But uh, I, I absolutely 
loved it and your blends were were great but um one of the things that you have done that i was i wrote a mead book uh, a few years ago and by the way no one I, mean, I think maybe my mom and like my brother bought that book. I don't think many people bought that book. Some Vikings. Yeah, it's some Vikings, you know, but again, I love mead. I've tried making mead or I do make mead. And I had this vision of bringing you my jars of mead. And then as I'm about to pack them, I was like, I can't do it. <laughs> what, what if Mater doesn't like my mead? I can't do it. <laughs> yeah, well, I think there's, I think when it comes to something like me, because it's such a very focused, simple thing, people try to overwork it and overdo it uh, to make it more complex or unique or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, beer was cool and then IPAs happened. I'm sorry, I'm not an IPA guy. <laughs> um, so I think a lot of people uh, just overwork the mead. Um, but you're, you're, uh, you, you put out the best canned mead I've ever had. I, I mean that, and I, when, I, when this, when I first tasted this, I texted uh, Dino, your manager, our mutual friend. I was like, this is the best mead I've ever had from a can. Most of it's like put in wine bottles. People can't get the canning down, but love to taste this with you yeah, if you're, right. if you're yeah, down. Yeah. This is the, um, the Queen Bee. Uh, talk me through this one here. Uh, Queen Bee mead uh, ingredients, really, really complex, mm -hmm. long list of ingredients. Water, yeast, honey. That's tough. Carbonation. Good luck. Do you? How long do you, you ferment? Just, you need me to say that again, or you need a pencil? How do you do? You use any uh, yeast nutrient with this? Yeah, definitely, because we found that the that the honey doesn't have enough nutrient in it at all right. to ferment. So we're constantly kind of going back and forth. Normally, in wine making process, we're adding depending on uh, the ants when we first, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the nutrients when it first shows up, we might be adding something or not adding something uh, at the beginning of fermentation for grapes. And then maybe midway, we'll give it a nudge to make sure that it finishes all the way. With mead, we found that there's zero nutrients in the honey. That's just sugar, so it's energy, but it's not, it's not food for the yeast. Mm -hmm. So we take whatever we would do for winemaking, and we divide that up into every other day. Wow. So it's just a s small microdose of nutrients every other day and punch downs basically punch stirs basically with the punch down tool just stir the stir the mead now do you have um uh do you have bees that you work with uh, this is supposedly on the container it says arizona honey okay i have not actually <laughs> researched the regulations to see how loose that term is but right. uh, it's wildflower honey from arizona now that's the next that's the next step in like making mead is like you start your own hive is that, is that coming up? Nope. That's a lot of work. Uh, I had a lot on my plate. So, but, you know, because there are a lot of hives in Arizona, apparently we can get mead by the 55-gallon well, you know, drum. And what I love about mead is that it's so refreshing. It's so, um, and it gives back to the environment. You know, it's a big, you know, without bees, right, we don't have, we have nothing. So that's the, um, it, 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 I try to get people that, that are into the environment, helping the environment to drink more mead, but it's a hard sell. I, I have a hard time getting people to drink mead. Like they just don't get it. They don't want to, they don't like it or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But when you put it in a glass next to some fried chicken mm -hmm. or, a nice, or a nice fennel salad or something like that, and you just don't tell them what it is. You just put it in there next to the thing and they don't yeah. think about it. Yeah. There's no preconceived notions. They're just having experience. And they right. Go, I want I want more of this. Well, it's it's fantastic. And what's the what's the what's the black label? What's the difference here? That's the Malvasia Bianca. That's the okay. white wine. So that's similar carbonation. Yeah. So not mead. Not mead. White wine. What we're fighting with this process of canning. Um, out of the can, tastes one way. Out of a glass, it tastes different. Hmm. Why do you think that is? I don't know. The, the aluminum is. Maybe the coldness of the the tip there. Yeah, I guess. But like you, you sip it like that. But grab the glasses, Cal. It's just a different experience once you've taken it out of the can. Yeah, definitely. It immediately opens up. 
So when we pour some, when people are reluctant to like cans, I don't tell them it's a can. They go, oh yeah, we don't, I don't like canned wine. Okay, yeah, we'll get you this other one. Put this in the glass, put it in front of them. They go, oh, I like this. Yeah. You really need to get out of your own way, buddy. <laughs> it's just a Malvisi Bianca with sparkling. Wow. Well. So in the last um, in the last couple of years, we've we've uh, we've heard a lot about um, California grapes, can you, the smoke. Uh, how have the how have the grapes in Arizona been growing? Uh, and has there been any like smoke coming this way? No, not a lot of smoke here. We did have some fires in the region a couple of years ago, but we did we dodged a bullet on on the way the wind was blowing. Hmm. Uh, you know our biggest. Our biggest hurdles here are monsoons when the rains come, mm. as far as bunch rot and that kind of you know, navigating uh, wet, navigating the water. So you definitely don't have too much, too much water though. At any given year, it's that's pretty, pretty stable. Yeah. We're, well, this last year was uh, the heaviest rains we've had in in a long time. Mm. Uh, I don't remember having it be this wet, but five straight weeks of rain like with a few days off in between every three days. Uh, we were trying to harvest on those in-between days. Uh, so it was, it was pretty brutal from, I'm gonna say the beginning of July all the way into uh, near the middle end of August. What was it like uh, managing a winery during the pandemic? It's at my house, I just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, same, same as any day, you walk up, walk outside in your underwear and deal with the grapes. You are you're uh, picking grapes in your underwear, most okay. days. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now I understand, like when um, you know when when Jerome was um, dealing with the pandemic, you were you stepped up and really helped that community and tried to be there for for your neighbors. What was uh, what was that period like? Um. Well, you know, during you know all that shutdown, you had to. I figured most of us were just scratching our head going, is it what it is? Is it not what it is? I have to, at some point you just have to trust what you're hearing and go, okay, I guess we all kind of have to bond together and figure out how to navigate this thing that mm -hmm. historically we've seen them come through. So there should be a fairly beaten path on figuring out how to do this. So you kind of sign on to whatever yeah. that is to figure it out, but I can't stop farming my gardens. I can't stop doing the vineyards so whatever shutdown was happening anywhere else in those vineyards luckily you're outside and you're distancing yourself from people but we we couldn't shut down mm -hmm. the gardens we couldn't shut down the vineyards so there's produce and then we're not open so we were putting together baskets for our employees to take home every week in a little, little care package that that whole time frame was 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 tough and one of the brightest moments of, of the pandemic for me uh, was your was Pusifer's live stream. Ah. That was the best live stream that anyone did. Yeah, we had fun with that. We ended up doing three more. Yeah, so it was. That, it just ended up being that you go, oh, that's how you do this. This seems like a, a cool format to present music. And the way that it was, it, it felt to me like a documentary to, uh, to your style of music. And it was, it was beautiful. You know, we watched it, and then, you know, when we got the opportunity to watch it again, it was like, it was my wife and I, it was our first, like, real date, because we got, the kids were able, to, like, something happened that night, like, the the YMCA, like, took our kids, you know, they had, like, a, your kids wear masks, and you can uh, have a date night, and it just so happened to be your live stream, and... Um, we just do this dog kennel. You know, Put them outside. I swear to God, I would. That'd be awesome. You? How old are your kids? Uh, they were about. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> she's eight now. So I have a nine-year-old, yeah. nine and four now, and that's just uh, young enough to not be able to get out of the dog cage. Yeah. Well, if you do padlocks the right on the outside, you're good. But um, but that was uh, that was that was a great night because that music just it hit, and I think. You know, sometimes you hear a song or you see a concert when you need to see it, and that was one of those musical moments for me. So, 
Cheers to that. Cheers. Thank you. But you enjoyed putting that together? Yeah. Yeah. It was a fun time. It was great. It was great. Is, is there a different performance level for you or in terms of like how you sing or or your moves or something when you're doing a, doing something like that versus on the stage? Uh, yes and no. I mean, you're trying to, you're paying attention to what's the, what are they trying to do on this particular pass? Are they trying to get a particular angle? Are we trying to get a, uh, a particular audio? Mm -hmm. so when you're doing those pay-per-views, you're trying to find the hero audio track all the way through. Mm. So now you're kind of editing little pieces of the film. You're trying to use what was shot for that song for the edit from multiple angles, you know, four cameras going at once. But, you know, you might not have caught an angle, so you have to edit in another one from another take. Yeah. You're, trying to, you're trying to preserve as much as you can a single audio take and a single video take with four different cameras to make that work. So when it comes to, you know, to the filming, you just have to be talking to the, uh, the director to go, okay, what's the, what are we trying to catch on mm. this pass? Are you trying to catch close up? Are you trying to catch far away? Are we trying to catch audio? Because, you know, audio, you're not going to be running around as much because you can hear it in your voice. Because yeah, some, some different genres of music would, would, would cut the filming and then go in the studio and, and sing. Yeah, no, that's, no, we didn't do that. And it, it strikes me as like, you know, you have, you have three different, and, and with you, you have nine different layers because you have three bands that I know of, and, know of. that I know of, um, uh, you have, um, you have your studio. I wrote all Beyonce songs. <laughs> yeah. so do, do you get, do you get a quarter of the Grammys or? You guess which ones. <laughs> None of them. So you have you have studio performance, you have stage performance, and then you have you know something like a document documentary style or live stream. Is is there is there a common is there a common is there anything common there when you're when you're going between the three or is it different every time? Uh, from from the bands. Or from the, well, from I, well, the documentary, so, like filming yeah. to live to recording. Let's let yeah, let's take it step one. Okay. You know, from like the actual execution of it, filming versus studio versus uh, on the stage. Yeah, uh, there's yeah studio. There's no audience, so you're definitely not worrying about what you're wearing that day. You know, so that's back to the underwear. Yeah, it's just you're just trying to make sure you're getting the correct audio, and a lot of it is it's all general to specific you're getting riffs down you're getting ideas down scatting and trying to figure out what the, what that finished thing is going to be and it's a back and forth exchange so it's more about the ideas not the performance or what where the lights are and then when you actually go to record it you know it's you're focusing on that on focusing mm -hmm. on the, the actual performance and then matching that performance throughout the entire recording live of course is there's just a lot of a lot more lights and a lot more movement and so you're making sure you're combining at the end of the day the performance vocally musically has to be on par mm -hmm. it has to be you have to nail it so you have to find your restrictions in terms of movement and running around and whatever the production is so that you're not you're still you know running around like a clown on stage but you're still performing the song so that audio when you walk away it sounded correct right you know, a lot of Christians back in the seventies with you know the, the old rock and roll bands that show up and play their songs like these guys fucking suck, <laughs> you know, because they're not they're not playing like they did in the studio. There's all right. kinds of cool layers and two inch tape, and it sounds like the way it sounds. There's five layers of guitars, and on stage the actual only one guitar player is on heroin. It doesn't work. That happens sometimes. Now, when you go to the only in the 70s, though. No, not, definitely not in the Never modern in time. Never in any other era. Not in this time. Drugs. <laughs> when, when you look at the... So when you... Do you take a different approach with the three different bands? Because... No, it, it's, just, it's just conversations. Mm -hmm. It's different conversations. I'm sure, like, when you've... Whatever you've done this, when, you have, when you're interviewing somebody, you're going to talk to me a different way than you talk to the producer of this, producer of this, producer of this. There, there's... They bring a different energy into the room, so you're going to end up talking yeah. in a different way. It's a different conversation. Well, I never get to talk about mead, so I mean, I could have done the entire See, thing on mead. Right away. You there's, know, there's a, there's a huge difference. So, yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's all about it's all about uh, living, breathing conversations. Mm -hmm. So, different set of people, different conversation, different set of skills, different approaches to things. Yeah, and then you also have you have so many uh, so many different uh, aspects to like how you you know you get businesses and everything. Now you're into wine. What uh, what about whiskey? What do you what do you normally drink in the whiskey world? Uh, you know I. I've had whiskey over the years. Uh, the thing that I'm, you know, full pedestrian. Uh, huh? You want this glass? That's how you want it. You want it in the glass. What? Never mind. Just... Dude, Sorry. we're having a conversation here. <laughs> Are you drunk? Yeah, I was trying to get <laughs> He may be. I don't know. Try it Uh I think Angel's Envy was my in, my gateway drug into okay. starting to dive into all the mixers and you know the, there's just the, you're, there's, you, there's do a, you like rye or bourbon more bourbon you like bourbon more like bourbon. okay but I do I do I'm I'm trying to work my way through understanding uh, rye in the context of having it straight or having it in a drink like right an old fashioned with rye to me is like so I, I, you know, I like old-fashioned with rye but mm -hmm, i haven't mm -hmm. i haven't found my groove on the rye that you want neat on the rocks or yeah neat. You know, I'm, I'm well i think I, my way. i think hearing you know, this just like you know just like american palate of like mountain dew and coca-cola right and you start to get into wines you're like you want big oak high alcohol rich wines because yeah. you're so used to drinking coca-cola so you know i don't know my gateway drug was the, was the angel's envy so I brought a, I brought a, a more of a classic Kentucky rye. Okay. This is a Michter's 10 year. Now rye is, uh, this is a category that has kind of just coming back. You know, it's, it, it was uh, a category that was huge back in the day, but it's, what is it, a 10% alcohol, eight? So this is uh, this is 90, 90 proof. So forty five percent, forty uh, ninety two, ninety two. <laughs> He's trying so hard to maintain. I'm the idiot over here. Ten percent. Well, you, you know, it's like a beer, right? You can pound this. <laughs> so, um, well, I just let's just taste it. So. As it implies, it's made of rye. Yeah, rye has so to be. Me, help me out as a as a pedestrian, like. To... In in the, the rye, it's kind of like. Um, so, if you were to think of this as like a grape, like you can make tempranillo, you can grow tempranillo like anywhere, mm -hmm. um, but you can only do uh, like a I'm just picking up. You know. You can only do a Bordeaux blend in one place, you know, it has okay. to be in the Bordeaux. Right. Right, so let's say Cab Franc. So you can grow Cab Franc and, and do uh, Cab Franc anywhere, but you can only make one, you know, you can only put Bordeaux on one label. Okay. Bourbon, you can only make, you can make that style anywhere in the world, but you can only put bourbon on a label if it's made in the United States. Okay. Uh, with rye, rye can be made anywhere in the world. Rye can be labeled anywhere in the world. Um, there's American styles of rye. There's Finnish styles, Canadian styles, so it's, there's different styles all over the world. And within uh, America, United States, rather, you got the Pennsylvania styles, you got the Maryland styles, you got your New York styles, and then you have your Kentucky styles, which are usually very low in rye because when you ferment rye, it foams. And the Kentucky distillers are not very good at controlling the foam. They, even today, they're not that good. Back in the day, they used to layer the uh, fermenters with lard that was their only enzyme that they knew of that would absorb the the uh, the, the foam. How the fuck did they figure that out? <sighs> Old school. Hey, kind I have an idea. <laughs> hey, it worked. It, it did. <laughs> How did you figure that out? Now they have food enzymes. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, but the, the Kentucky ryes are typically sweeter, typically... Um, a little more oak forward but uh this one here when they go in the barrel they're going in the barrel at like 103 entry proof uh so that actually adds a little to me adds a little velvety to it 
So you, what, uh, what other places going to? What proof do they normally go in? So like Jim Beam, 125. Okay. You know, so the higher you go up, the the law is you can't go any higher than 125. So they they go to the max because you get more volume out of a barrel uh, once they go to bottle it. Okay. And so it's it's uh, more soluble in the barrel, and you know it's getting it's extracting less phenols, and so there it's a better interaction with the barrel over long term, short term doesn't matter but long term it really matters in whiskey if you go in at a 110 or lower versus 125 so so you can you can age it better at 110 than you can at 120 or yes over long periods of time okay if you if you are if you are bottling at eight years old it, it doesn't really matter but once you hit 12 the higher you go up the more wood you're going to extract okay. and people some people like that I'm not an oak guy. I don't like over, anything over oaked. So this is and, elegant. Yeah, this is um, this is, if not my favorite, one of my favorite ryes on the market right now. Awesome. Yeah, this is this is on my shelf. I brought you an extra bottle too. And another. Um, Fight you later. <laughs> One of the another fun thing kind of coming out now is a lot of people are using different uh, malting techniques. Uh, chocolate malt is a kind of a kind of malt that they're starting to add into the rotation. Um, and when they when they put it in the fermentation, they'll use like one, two, three percent, mm-hmm. and they'll turn the whole thing into like chocolate oatmeal. And it can has a has a real big flavor impact. This is uh, this is a five grain chocolate malt from uh, Rabbit Hole, which is right down the road from uh, Angels Envy, actually. Thank you. And you can smell that, that there's some astringency in this. Yep. It's very different. This is a bourbon. It's almost like it has, I'm not used to uh, uh, a, a bourbon having EA. It's like a, if I smelled that in my cellar, I'd be like, oh, but in here it works because it's whiskey. Is the alcohol higher on this one than it is in this one? It is. So it burns right down the center. Not quite 10%. 109. <laughs> Just north. Just north of 10%. That's interesting. And the, and so they, they actually have the, is it um, like chocolate, like cocoa powder that they're putting in? or is it like No, a, it's like an actual, extract? that's an actual um, varietal of uh, barley. Oh, okay. And when, they, when they malt it, it's used... It was first, and it was first used, to my knowledge, in Ireland. Uh, Bushmills used a lot of uh, chocolate malt in their malting process, and they learned, you know. And then Bushmills, you know, kind of showed the world that you could do some with it, and so people started buying it. And not a lot out there, but um, you know, they germinate it to malt it, and it just it just puts out a completely different profile. Sorry. Grabbing Calvin in here. Calvin's got to get it. I smell that one too. Next to each other. I like that. One of the one of the things that uh, I've I've learned about um, ab- about winemaking is that you don't see in um, in whiskey making is that it's it's fermentation is pretty basic and whiskey like they they will they will stick to a three to five day schedule uh very few people use natural yeast you know it some of it's propagated some of it's dry but uh there's no there's not a lot of uh experimentation in the fermentation so they're like we're not screwing with that because they can't risk uh they can't risk it whereas in winemaking there's so so much um 
there's so much you can do in fermentation. And it has a lot that can go wrong. And a lot that can go wrong. What do you, what's a sweet spot for you when it comes to fermenting? Well, it comes, it comes down to the farming. So my team, uh, Chris Turner and Jesse Noble, Chris is up north, Jesse's down south. Uh, they just farm meticulously. And if there's anything rot going on you know, with all these rains, we have spending a lot of extra money with a crew to go through the day before pick, mm -hmm. dropping anything in that particular block that looks like it's compromised in any way. Birds, bugs, hail, rot, anything. Get rid of it so that when we actually get the fruit into the cellar, it's pristine. Mm -hmm. uh, so because it's pristine and because it's dry, I can do wild ferments all day long. And there's a natural population now in our cellar for having done a lot of natural oh, fermentations. Wow. It just goes through. And we're finding that the natural fermentations provided the fruit is pristine. It'll go through perfectly, steadily. It doesn't, doesn't shoot up and need nutrients and then it dies. It just kind of has this nice steady done. Mm. And in the process of that, it goes through its secondary fermentation near the end naturally without having to add uh, a, a secondary uh, fermentation. Wow. Yeast. Um, bacteria. Um, but if you get bad fruit in and there's something you missed, it, it, it can go sideways, but it doesn't go any more sideways than a commercial yeast where, you know, oh, this is great. And then it gets to a certain point, it's like, oh, it's kind of stuck. What do I do? Oh, we happen to sell this thing that fixes that problem. So we're finding we're not spending a lot of money on yeast just because the natural fermentation, we're spending the money in the vineyard to make sure that the fruit comes in pristine. So we're still spending, we're still spending the money, right? Because you have to do more meticulous work in the in the vineyard, but we're not having to spend a bunch of money on yeast and fixes and everything else on the on the other end. There's got to be, you know, the natural wine market too is huge. People well, love that. I mean, you know, we're not catering to that because uh, I think that's a that's a trap. Um, but you know, that it, <laughs> most of the wines you get out of Europe historically for the last three thousand years have been natural fermentations. Yeah. So. That's not a big deal. It's just you're paying attention to what the pristine fruit is coming out of the vineyard to make sure that you're taking advantage of the natural yeasts on your site to make it more of a unique um, experience for that place, right. place at a time. When I was covering Spanish wine, um, one of the things I was covering was a big cooperative scandal where they were, you know, French wine or French, you know, uh, vin de Pays was actually being made and Spain at one big giant cooperative mm -hmm. uh, trucks, in the middle of the night. trucks in the middle of the night Let's yeah see. sandwiches Why are sandwiches in a tanker truck it uh, we we've had that in whiskey too mm -hmm. um, it just seems to me like the the transparency in alcohol can always just use just a little touch more you know yeah, but I don't think there's anything wrong with you know with uh, with the bulk wine market if you know that it's a bulk wine market it's a sign of a healthy wine industry to have bulk wine being passed around. Um, but, you know, you do want that unique experience for that unique place, so it should be truthful for what it is. Just be truthful on the bottle. You know, you can, people will buy bottles that say red wine from somewhere. They'll buy it. And sometimes it's in a bag. Yes. You know. Box, bag, can. Yeah, it's all over the place. As long as you're just truthful on the labeling and people are honest, then it's great. The next one we're going to taste here. This is a, there's a lot on this label. This is, uh, this is basically an Indiana bourbon finished in uh, triple sec liqueur and sparkling wine barrels. So this is a first. Uh, not, this is, uh, I was texting with the so blender sparkling early. sparkling wine, so that's, there, I have questions about that. So are they actually, is it like a method chef and where they're finishing the wine in that barrel and then racking it out and re-fermenting and disparaging is there actually sparkling wine in the barrel or is it sparkling wine base in the barrel the, Lots so of the, technical questions here that so the sparkling wine would have been talking about. <laughs> it would have been a barrel that would have aged it and is out into the used barrel market in, okay. in whiskey you have all these distillers that are looking for barrels to finish their whiskey in because that's right. the craze everybody wants to get in right. and it um, you know you, you bring up a good question and will, we do we do a we do a sparkling wine that is it's basically a, a filtered pet mat and it goes right into bottle and it's crown capped but we don't actually age the bottle we don't age the wine in a barrel it goes right from tank as it's fermenting filtered down filtered down like 0.4 residual sugar we, we 
bottle it. But you know, method Chef and Wah, you're going completely dry in the barrel, aging it mm -hmm. for a little bit, and then putting it back somewhere else and re-fermenting it and bottling that. Well, this is this uh, the barrel brokerage market is actually a little bit scammy. There was you don't a, say. yeah, a little bit. <laughs> there were a bunch of Tokai barrels that came on the market, and they were actually like French brandy barrels. Oh. And like a, a winemaker caught it. Same thing. But the, right? <laughs> Not at all. But yeah. so Tokai, for those, uh, that's a, a Hungarian grape that Slovenia used to claim was their grape, and there was that, that's a whole other thing, uh, which is it's it's wine, right? It's a, it's a sweet wine. Whereas French brandy would absolutely not be a wine. It's right. distilled spirit. It's distilled grape spirits. Yeah, it's a completely different category. Yeah. But, the, but the government was like, ah, it's okay. And so there's a lot of Tokai barrels out there on the market. That people are saying it's finished in Tokai barrels, and they weren't, ac they weren't actually finished in Tokai barrels. And the people who did it don't even know. Right. Uh, there's only like two or three distillers that no and caught it you would think putting your nose in there you would be able to tell that that's that's booze and that's wine but that's just it too is like there is not there's not as many educated people out there doing it they're like oh that's definitely different yeah The mead's a very good palate cleanser. Is it? You find out right now. I've actually never used mead as a palate cleanser until now. <laughs> until earlier. And I was like, holy shit, my palate is like really clean. Yeah. We did a we just did some just as an experiment because most of what we're doing with all these labels is were about subtlety. We wanted to see what happened with the mead when I actually fermented it with various herbs. So we have we're going to put them on tap at the 48 Wine Works down here at some point. Um, canned and tap with a, uh, there's one that's lavender, there's one that's uh, okay. rose petal. Yeah. We did a star, star jasmine, we did a hibiscus, we did a bergamot. Okay. Just to see what that looks like as a subtle thing. And we, I went over the top trying to make sure there was a lot in there, thinking, okay, we'll get it done and then we'll cut it back with uh, basic, that's really basic, basic mead. That's really old very, school right there. It is very subtle. It's like it's very, it's, it's just, it's almost on the nose, yeah. not necessarily on the palate. So it's, it was kind of nice. If you add some, uh, add some barley in there, make it a braggot. That's, that's a category. I'm not sure if he's making this up or not. No, braggot is, uh, yeah, so, yeah, uh, braggot. Braggot's a whole category. <laughs> From back in the 1500 uh, right. Great yeah. Britain uh, ale houses. Okay. Meat is such a beautiful story because it's the beginning of like commercial alcohol you know this is the stuff that you know alcohol was certainly made before but this was the branded stuff that people were requesting in in halls or in on markets of some kind and they would then l l comes out and just cleans the clock right of, of mead and uh i have all of this research from the 1500s to 1700s of all these debates going back and forth between l and mead and L wins out in a in a very big way. So I wonder, uh, riffing is that because of the convenience of the product that they're yeah. making? That the You're not going to get stung. Speed at which you yeah yeah, and the and the sting and and everything about it, like uh, gathering the honey, mm -hmm. it's just an easier process to get done. Yeah, the gathering of the honey was a was a was a big thing. Like there there were people who did it, and I'm guessing they didn't beat you commercial honey farm. No. Well, the Russians did. The Russians uh, created, uh, you know, some of the early, like, hive, you know, controlled hives. Uh, but most of the time, they were just gathering them. And there's a whole thing of mad honey, which now we know about. Uh, but, but places like uh, Turkey and Greece, they would make mead out of, like, a honey that had a hallucinogen in it. And so people were, like, losing their minds. It was, uh, it was, it was a whole thing. <laughs> Get arrested. By the way, not illegal to make uh, to make that kind of meat. It's somebody somebody out there makes it. Some other weird stuff that you can make things out of. Next uh, up. <laughs> you can get you can get beaver butt juice as a, as an actual flavoring. You know, 
get the extract of the you're, so you're super into beaver butt right it's a whole thing yeah there's a nice little sweet extract in the anal speaking glands speaking of being arrested <laughs> Calvin is Calvin a guy we gotta watch yeah yeah, yeah. well if you have a beaver yeah watch your beaver no that's good Mm. Yeah, it was a little hot on the palate initially, but um, it has that that finished in some kind of a port or sweet barrel thing that I like. I like how it's got it a it's got a funk out. to it. Yeah, I can get on board with that. My question on on whiskey in general is, when it's actually fermented and it's done, you have the spirit that's left over. I'm assuming that that it's a clear spirit, and right? It's undrinkable. It's just. Like, so, so you mean like so? Once you mean when when it's distilled? Yeah, when it's distilled. And the fermentation stuff drops to the bottom, like some of the grains and stuff. Is that what you're talking about? No, I'm talking about the actual spirit coming out. When it's all done, you have this this spirit right before you put it in oak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it is it just a clear? Uh, they refer to early in the old days, uh, like in old uh, Ireland, they referred to it as singling. Because it make people sing, uh, but uh, they call it new make today or white dog. Mm -hmm. But no, it's very drinkable. In fact, it, there are some people their their white dog was so good they created a moonshine label out of it okay. and would sell this clear spirit. And sometimes it's a matter of like they got to make money. You know, they got to you, you know how much money it takes to run one of these places. It's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. And and if you have to wait four years to have a product that you can sell, and if you need a cash flow, they would they would sell the stuff straight off the still. Sometimes they would flavor it. Ladies and gentlemen, vodka. There, and if it's distilled at 190 proof, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, vodka has to be distilled at 190 proof in the States and be odorless and tasteless. Crazy. And it sucks. Vodka. <laughs> so, uh, uh, what do you think about vodka? Um, <laughs> <laughs> vodka sucks. Well, actually, uh, Calvin and Tim and I and Dave are working on a gin project. So gin is exciting. Vodka sucks and gin is exciting because the the things that you can do with juniper and what have you. And, you know, I own a spirits competition called the American Spirits Council of Tasters. And what I have found is, like, the the gins that are coming, coming to us uh, for competition, the best ones are, are overseas. You know, everything here in the States is so marketing. There's some good gins, but they don't get they don't get the love because you know they're more into the craft like uh saint george mm -hmm. out of uh alameda california amazing gin he does a, a rye dry gin it's amazing yeah we're trying we're basically trying to find that path to creating a very elegant are, awesome gin. are you gonna maybe distill it or are you no, we want to we want to go to a guy and go here's our recipe here's our marketing yeah. here's our thing but like we have very you know me i'm like i'm not gonna just I'm not going to put some vodka in a bottle and call it gin. Thank wanna, God. It's, it has to be. It has to be a fantastic yeah. gin. Um, and we've been experimenting for years now. I've been experimenting with Amaro. Oh yeah. So tasted that yesterday. It's great. Did you taste the the the, the port or the Amaro? Who had the Amaro? Uh, I had an Amaro in the uh, in my the flight. Tasty, the tasty kitchen. Yeah, I'd have to look what? up. The, in Scottsdale, old Scottsdale. Yeah. Well, he must. Have, he must have something on the list from somewhere that so wasn't ours. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he said it was yours. He's on uh, crack. Okay. He needs to start smoking. All right. Uh, well, we, can't, we can't actually sell Amaro. Unless, you, unless we give him a sample from the... We the did not have Amaro in did your uh, kitchen. And uh, oh, no. did not, that uh, did not exist. Well, so. because it's, it's weird in Arizona. You can actually... I can make fortified wine in my cellar, but I have to wiggle my nose and call Bewitched to miraculously have spirits show mm -hmm. up in my cellar to make a fortified wine. I can't actually have it. See, that's cellar. fascinating to me because I, I look at the laws of Arizona's alcohol, and you all are one of the more progressive ones. Yeah. You just, you're just you about to advance a bill here that changes the tax for RTDs mm -hmm. to make it equivalent to, like, you know, the crap that uh, is called White Claw. And then you all have a, a, a tasting-only permit for distillers from other states. Mm -hmm. So this is a really advanced state for alcohol. Some. Not yeah. all of it. They're, they're really they they still have their big boot on the neck of the wine industry, uh, as far as caps for production, oh, um, just like trying to understand what it is we do with spirits. Because mm. you know every now and then something goes wrong, 
I should be able to distill my grape wine. Wow. Turn it, bring it down to brandy and then add that to a, to, to make my fortified wines or an Amaro. It's a, yeah. grape, a grape based, a fruit based spirit. We're working on, so here's, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to figure out, and I don't want to use the word white claw because it's a negative, awful thing. I did say that. So if you like uh, white claw, you it's know. just Zima. Yeah. Um, just like the, the Scooby Doo mask drops down and it's the it's Zima. Uh, the one, we're trying to take our Amaro and actually add it to carbonated water, yeah. or actually add it to distilled water and then add carbonation back, you know, uh, do with a Charmont tank in it. We're trying to find that perfect amount of alcohol level to make it be. All the flavors are crazy coming out of the Amaro, but like I'm actually getting down to like not very much of the Amaro in the carbonated water, and you still have this beautiful. Mm -hmm. drink that's actually you know it's 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 elegant but it's still you can still still tell that it's an amaro based alcohol drink um what is what is white claw uh white claw would just basically be uh malt liquor like a malt like okay. they use like a malt liquor beverage so, which you know fireball so like a, equal parts shit and fuck yeah pretty much All right. it, so i had a uh sorry I had a uh, lead singer. Sorry, of kids. A, <laughs> that's, a, that's a technical term. I had a lead singer of, of a band on my show who was talking about he loves White Claw. I called him out so hard on it. And I, was like, and I was like, what are, you, what are you doing? They should be hobbled. <sighs> I was, for liking that. I was, dis I was disappointed. Well, I mean, that's, so that's, that's when you went up against. I'm talking to my friends going, let's, do, let's take the Amaro. Let's do a carbonated, like a, you know, carbonated yeah. drink. That's, that, what, are, what is that alcohol level in the water that makes mm -hmm. it so nothing weird's going to grow in it and it's still like safe to drink but it's delicious but i'm able to really take something went wrong in the cellar you have your you have your your brandy mm -hmm. uh left over rather than just doing fortified wines or you know amaro like you have to charge you know a lot of money for a little taste of amaro to put it in a can it seems like a, hmm. i don't know it seems like a smart thing to do because it's delicious yeah hopefully hopefully that you know, things can get worked out here in the state where you all can do that because that would be, that'd be a very awesome and advanced product. I did not, the, I would love to see, I would love to see this everywhere. Like, I mean, I would love, this is the best. He would love to have you see that everywhere. <laughs> I, I, I'm just such a fan of this. And I've, I mean, when you sent me this a while back, I mean, I drank it probably within a week, two weeks because I don't, usually the meat I get it's it's like in a wine bottle. You got to go through a whole thing with it. I want it, and it probably has like eight percent residual sugar. Yes, it's just nasty. It's like yeah. drinking maple syrup. There's some great meads out there. Yes, Let's, there's yeah. some great meads out there. But to me, they have they've never gotten themselves in a good the. It's it's a hobby for most people. Mm -hmm. It's making meat at home. That's that's what meat is. You want to open the the bubbles? Let's do it. And 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 when you get a chance, open the Lely Nebbiola Rosé, but. Try it first, because I'm not sure how it's going to follow what we just did here. It could be a train wreck. Very specific. But it's not White Claw, so it's there's that. No. Yeah, Fort Wine Wineworks down here is our, uh, one of our other labels yeah. and places, and we have a whole series of, of postcards that are like a, like a Weekly World News cover. Oh, nice. And we have a whole Scooby-Doo one where it's like it's revealing that yeah. White Claw is a crap Zima. <laughs> There. May I? There you go. Sorry. This is our pet now. Okay. I'm obviously a Bianca and Chardonnay blend. One. There you go. Is that all right? Is that in the way? Okay. Good. Okay. So this is. Uh, this is one of those experiments where you're trying to figure out how to how to skip the whole disgorging yeah. mushroom cap process. But most pet nats you get have just way too much. You know, the natural ones just have like a big pile of clay in the bottom of their bottle. It's super cloudy. We were managing to, as through, through fermentation, just with just putting it through a plate and frame, just kind of taking some of the residual stuff out as we go. What do you like to pair with this? Uh anything i'm um, thinking shrimp this smells yeah, like a good yeah, kind of shrimp. Uh, you know 
we do a lot of, uh, we do a, at the tasting room down in, at the, at the Merkin, we do a lavadure, lava so it's a lot of grilled vegetables and some hummus and, and some uh, pickled cauliflower, stuff like that. So it's just a nice array of grilled vegetables goes yeah. with this. Um, I've had it with popcorn, a little bit of truffle salt on some popcorn and, and this. Again, in your underwear. Netflix. Netflix in the underwear. Are you a whitey tidies guy or more boxer? More like, you know, or thong. boxers, you know, oh, okay. colored boxers. Colored boxers, all right. Yeah. For a second, I thought you were going to say thong. I was. You, you know. beat me to it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so having been out of the wine game professionally for, for, um, you know, for some time now, I've noticed how much my palate has changed because it's, it's, you know, and this was one of the challenges I had when I was making the decision, when I knew I had to choose wine or whiskey, um, and I chose whiskey in a, in a large part because I love the people, but also the proximity. I'm in Kentucky, right? Right. And we could not get, I couldn't get wine shipments to me. And so it was very difficult to taste a lot distribution of distribution laws and all that. Yeah, kind of major. Stuff. Now yeah. it's legal there. Like it's it's legal to ship to me, but back then it wasn't. And um, they called them felony states, right? And mm -hmm. Kentucky was one of the bad ones. Um, South Dakota is still insane. Michigan, I understand, is the worst. Uh, Do you find that? They can that? be weird. They haven't been weird with us because I'm okay. from Michigan, so. They let you. They let you, <laughs> let yeah. you go. But the I, I'm feeling I'm like this is something that I would be able to break down like ten years ago in a way, uh, you know that would be very different than now. Like now, it feels well, the, very. The, the first question is. I like it. It's delicious. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, that's it. There you go. Is it delicious? And you know the wines are very subjective. They're just having yeah. a person who understands how to break the wine down, they might not have the same palate as you. So their their review yeah. and their their approach to the wine might not be. What you have to do is basically pick a person who reviews wines that historically you've had wines that they liked, right. that you like, and not bother with the guys who have wines that you don't like. Right. So no offense to Robert Parker, but those are big wines that I don't, I don't drink those. So if he really yeah. likes them, I probably won't like them. Yeah. And that's, people follow me for the same reason. Like, you know, I don't like oak. And if I pick a whiskey, they know that it's not going to be over oaked. But a lot of people like the oak. Um, uh, you know, the people I trained with coming up, training my palate. You know, I my experience of finding my palate kind of began when I came home from uh, Iraq, and I was in therapy. I was like a lot of soldiers, tough spot. Got in therapy, and one of the things they taught me was taste mindfulness, and I learned taste mindfulness in a therapy room with a barbecue potato chip. Oh, yeah. And it was like a light bulb went off of my head of like what I can taste and what things are, what my experience could be while I was also doing like aromatherapy. And I was covering uh, all these masters Somali. What's that? In a thong. In uh, a gre I was I was greased up. <laughs> Here we go. I was greased up in my wrestling singlet from right. high school. All right. So kind of thongy, yeah. but... So a lot of your a little bit more in, projectile. A lot of a lot of sense memories. Yeah. <laughs> but we have this. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm starting to train with these like master Somalis, and I have this like this new skill I learned. But the people I was tasting with, uh, Paolo Barberi, who is a master Som at uh, yeah, then they're Alex. Gonna, they're going to pick out things you need to even it, think were in the glass. It was amazing. Yeah. It, but it was like tasting with them. Like my favorite person to ever taste with was Isabel from uh, Fat Duck. It's Duck's. Cassis, yes, but from where? Yeah, <laughs> it's so cool. Come on, man, <laughs> cut me some slack. <laughs> Come on. But and I think when I when I go into a wine tasting, I I see how much the market has changed. Mm -hmm. That world is not as important. No, it's not. It's not as important today. Yeah, it was part. You know, significant portion of that back then was a prestige snooty yeah exclusivity thing um and those those reviews and those tasters were meant to go oh yeah you're not you're not allowed to be in this room if yeah. you don't understand what he's saying 
I think it's, we've kind of boiled it down more, and I think I really have to tip my hat to people like uh, Pavle Milich and uh, Kent Callaghan and Kelly and Todd Bostock, winemakers in Arizona, for just that approach of like, do you like it? Mm -hmm. First and foremost, do you like it? We can talk about all the nuances going down the road, and you recognize that there is complexities to it, and it is a well-made wine, and beyond that, it speaks of a place, but do you like it? Just because you can identify this thing and all the things that went on with it, and you know that it's natural or not natural or whatever it is, just because you can identify it doesn't mean that it's a good wine. Right. A lot of wines end up getting good scores because this little ego goes, oh, I yeah. smell cassis and I smell the thing and I identify that it was this thing. And you give it a good score because about you, about you being able to identify it rather than when it's all said and done, are you going to take your glass, go back over and fill it with that wine? Or are you going to go to this other one? Because it actually it was more intriguing and there's something mm -hmm. to it that was more delicious, but you didn't recognize what it was. Do you think, do you think uh, criticism is dead in wine, or do you think it's still important? I think it's kind of important just because, again, you just have to figure out what critic speaks to your palate. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's, I don't really know how else to put that. Well, you know, the, the wine world, too, has changed from a label. Like a, a, a label like Caduceus could not live um, as strongly as it does today, 20 years ago, which the, the wine consumer was was taught to believe that you have to have a chateau on there and it has to have and some kind of from this place where it's not wine. Yeah. So the absurdity. The wine consumer is is evolving in a big way. Right. In it's kind of whiskey is too. Whiskey whiskey is going more toward how wine is. With wine, you all have a lot more transparency than we do in whiskey. Whiskey, there's still people we don't we don't know where, where their whiskey's coming from. Um, there's people still violating federal laws of what you can put on a label. Mm -hmm. So you know it's it, it's kind of hit and miss, you know, right now with whiskey. But it's always a struggle. And gin, gin's even worse. They're, they're as far as like not knowing where it's coming from. Yeah, or? gin is like gin is a factory. It's like you've got all these different factories making whiskey or gin, mm -hmm. and nobody really, nobody really, um, you know, dis unless it's a small distiller, mm -hmm. they don't tell you much about it. It's branding, right? And, and I actually like Tanqueray, mm -hmm. I really do. Uh, I like Hendrix, um, but that is ninety percent branding. Their mm -hmm. process happens to be good, thankfully. Uh, but you know, there's monkey, monkey forty seven. Monkey forty seven. No, I don't think I've I've had uh, a good experience with that one. You don't like it? I don't think I've had that one. I like I like the it's a it's a molasses based spirit, and then there's you know apparently like forty seven different herbs and whatever. But I just it's one of those ones that if, the, if it's all the bottles are all sitting out. Mm -hmm. That's I'll, the one you're picking. I'll go back to that one. Uh, yeah, I don't. I think I had it in San Francisco, and I think I didn't give it a medal. Damn it! Well, hey, now you know. <laughs> now you know where my palate is. Right? Don't so, trust that guy. With now Jen. you know not to trust me. <laughs> that's all. That's, that's all there is. But to that, it. I mean, that's that. That is exactly what we're talking yeah. about. So, yeah. like, if there's gins that the guy gave that rating a good rating, and you had that gin, you liked it, not just because you were in the right setting with the right people and the right, right. sunset. You genuinely like the gin, and you've, you've gone back to it mm -hmm. multiple times, and not because of the memory of who you were with. Right. You genuinely like what's in the glass. And I'm a fan of blind tasting, especially uh, especially spirits. And one of my favorite stories to share about a blind tasting, Maynard, is the time I was covering something for, uh, thank you, for Somalia Journal, and we were doing a Gaia tasting in uh, in... In, uh, in New York with all these master sommeliers. Thank you. And they had 12, 12, uh, in Gaia put it on, it was uh, Terlato Importers. And uh, there were, um, I mean, it was all the, there's like 10 master sommeliers in there. And they snuck in Silver Oak in the, in the tasting. <laughs> Silver Oak beat Gaia, uh, it beat uh, Petrus. It beat like, it beat like a lot of A-list wines. What year was this? 
2011. Really? Yeah. And was it? And was it like a 2005? It was a standard, uh, standard silver oak, mm-hmm. and all these people. Well, are whatever saying, the current release was. At that yeah, time. it was. It was a bought off the shelf. They just threw it in there. Just and, to be dicks. Um. Yeah, I think. I, Honestly, I think it was just kind of a, a way to prove blind tastings don't mean shit. I mean, blind tastings can prove you don't know shit. Right. And the min- and I was the only journalist in the room. And the minute they revealed, because uh, these people were saying, yeah, this is Left Bank Bordeaux. Are you sure? Because I'm pretty positive this is Tuscany. And that's how varying they were on what Jesus, on on what Silver Oak was, and so when they revealed the bags, because you know they have the the, the bags on them, they revealed the bags, and they showed Silver Oak, and, and you saw people running out the fucking door. They're like, I don't want to be associated with this, right. and uh, yeah. Well, it is a it is a, f- a field level, and I've done that. I'm sorry if you've heard the story before, but I did, I've had wine writers come out before. And I would bag up stuff on the counter uh, just to go, look, this is not, we're not looking for a rating on this. I just need your opinion on, like, with our wines here, with these Tempranillos or these Sangioveses, just put them in order of what you think is the better one. Not a rating, just like, yeah, this one's first, this one's last. And just give us, you know, give us a number here. Um, did that several times with different different writers. Kind of a dick move. Uh, but then at the end, you, op- you pull the bags off and, you know, one of them is the Judith Tempranillo, a couple of Sancha. Um, I think we had a Tarzan in the lineup at some point, but like, you know, multiple years of Sancha, a year of Judith Tempranillo, mm-hmm. and then within it, four Vegas Sicilias. And so the Unico of Vegas Sicilia, like the unicorn version of Vegas Sicilia, in blind with our wines. And it wasn't Vegas Sicilia number one, two, three, and four, and then Caduceus, the rest right. of the four. It was mixed. It was the very first one was uh, Vegas Sicilia, the Unico. Unico, like the one that's like a multiple year, mm-hmm. one that's like, you know, undeniable in a glass. And then it was Caduceus. And then it was Vegas Sicilia. And it was Caduceus. And then it was Vegas Sicilia. So it was like down the line, it was a, 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 a playing field leveler. So you go, oh, so basically what you're saying is that Arizona has potential with Tempranillo. Nice. Because if that's the, if that's the, if that's the benchmark of Tempranillo out of Spain, and we're in the mix, not at the bottom of the pack, at the top of the pack. I've done that with Sangiovese, with, uh, with uh, not necessarily Brunellos, because I don't have a lot of oak on my wine, so mm-hmm. it's kind of hard to compete with a heavy oak Brunello, but like a Rosa de Montalcino. And I've done it with some of the secondary producers of uh, Nebbiolos and Barberos. But usually it's like, we're not at the bottom of the pack. So Arizona does have something to offer in terms of that story you just told about Silver Oak. It's amazing when the when it's all about the taste, and even even in that moment, the greatest pal, some of the greatest pals in the world. It's it's a in writers, you know, uh, depending on their course level, it's it's very different. Like tasting with Karen McNeil, that's different than tasting with you know a freelancer just doing Guy, this on the Guy side. Fury. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers, guy. <laughs> He's a tequila boy now. Yeah. So what do we have here? Uh, 100% Nebbiolo from northern Arizona as a rosé. So very grippy. Yeah. Um, got a lot of tannic structure, but this is, I have a bunch of this in my cellar still. Uh, usually sells out every year, but I kind of hold back two or three cases because I'm watching it age and bottle Yeah. as it goes. Uh, it actually, that's a very ageable Rosa. How much time does it have with the skin? Uh, that would be on skins for about 24 hours, and it goes right into right into tank. Because that color is it's beautiful. Yeah. We don't, leave, we, don't, we don't ferment it on skins. We don't actually ferment it on skins. We actually press it, but okay. we leave it in in the in the cellar for about 24 hours before oh. we actually press it. Yeah, that's not that would not be the color of rosé that I think you're your average consumer would um, yeah. connect that, with. Well, it's that, it's that kind of orangey rosé that you get yeah. like out of, uh, you know, what's the, there's a couple Italian rosés that are incredible. And the, and the Domaine Tempier, the French, uh, is it a Morved? Yeah, Morved. Mm. That's great. Yeah, so it's, it's an ageable rosé. 
that you close your eyes and it's, you're used to that kind of pinky thing you get at the grocery store. That's I mean, it's mosaic. just, it's just bold enough where you can have like a light filet with it or a yes. chicken, yeah. you know? Um, but I, I, I taste that and I automatically want oysters. So All right. I think they would go great with the oysters. You want to try it and do it, do the last whiskey we have? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we we tend to really drink a lot on this show. Sorry. For obvious reasons. So this is a barrel uh, barrel bourbon. This is their this is their gold label. Talking about transparency, you know they've got the states they're blending from. There they've got uh, multiple states that they're acquiring. Um, Stocks so, from? So they have to like a label as an American whiskey, not they, rather than a state whiskey. So this is this is a, this is a bourbon, but it's a blend of straights, and then it's uh, finished with a toasted oak, like a different, like you would toast um, a barrel for Chardonnay or something like. Okay. You, I, I'm not saying it's going to be a Chardonnay toasted barrel, but it'd be similar to that. Okay. But uh, they just. They have a lot on the label that's pretty transparent. So there's there's uh, several states in this, and um, and it's going into a secondary barrel, and you can right away that that oak just pops out. Right. You know, I'm not, and this is my first time tasting this one in several months, so I'm like, oh shit, am I gonna taste oak in this? It's gonna be over oaked. Yeah, it's. I think that's I think that's why I kind of gravitated towards the whiskeys that are finished in used neutral barrels, whether it's even with if it's a port or a right versus or, brand new. Yeah, brand yeah. new. Just I just I just kind of went to those. They're just smooth. They're smoother, and I'm kind of a pussy when it comes to you know to whiskeys. I'll have it on the rocks and you know, nothing wrong with drink that. It over the, drink it over unless the, unless you're judging in competition. Yeah, then you got to do. Then you you got to do it straight yeah. from the bottle. Yeah, that's my opinion. Makes sense. Yeah. Oh man. Going back to the mead. Yeah, I grabbed that one, wanting to talk about toasted with you. Speaking of. And uh, I. Uh, I have friends that would. Absolutely adore this because they like the oak. They, they like, like the oak, like yeah. That kind of peaty, you know, scotchy thing. Mm -hmm. That that's a little, a little too much for me. That's I, a it's way, good. it's way too much oak for me. And I will say, I gave no it no oak. <laughs> the the mead has no oak. However, the bees did fly on oak. Yes. I'm smelling the can. Like, what the fuck is wrong with me? You've had a bunch of whiskey. Yeah, I've gone. I've gone. I've gone too far. I'm smelling the can now. It's all right. Mm. So can what was? Can we talk about Legion just for a second? Let's do it. This is. I'm just. I'm excited about this project. So, Legion. Uh, well, that's a kick-ass label. This is a, it's by Four Eight Wine Works. Mm -hmm. So what I do is uh, every year uh, during harvest, during season, mm -hmm. you'll have fruit. As I was explaining, uh, Chris and Jesse. Be going through the vineyard prior to picks. There's going to be fruit on the vines that came out a little early and is way ahead of everything else in a particular block. So we go through and we pick all the ripe, super ripe clusters. This block is not ready to pick at all, but there's these clusters that are accelerated. Mm -hmm. We got to get rid of, get to drop them or whatever, or just let them hang for a little bit yeah. and then pick them intentionally. So we'll go around the, all the sites and pick things that are out of out of place. So like anything early gets picked, we just jam it all together. Okay. So across the entire state, mid-season too, like as you're going, this blocks, everything's kind of clipping along, but these ones are kind of standing out as clearly they're far riper than these others. And then there's going to be things that are green. So as you're picking this entire block, there's still a few things that you thought were going to catch up, but they didn't catch up, so they're green. So we wait a couple weeks at the very end, go around all the sites and pick all those random uh, lingering clusters. We might only get like off of this block. We might only get like, you know, eight five-gallon buckets of, of mm -hmm. grapes. And the same thing off all the other sites. We just ferment those all together, and we call it Legion. 
Okay. So this is our this is our Frankenstein together wine. Tell me about is, this label because that's very unique. So we we bottle every year. We bottle a hundred cases each. All right. Of 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 four different artists. So this particular artist is Daniel Martin Diaz, out of Southern Arizona, and so he's on the first hundred bottles. But there's artists that I've been working with, you know, all over the country, all over the world, that are that are contributing art to a bottling of this wine. So just like multiple grapes in one year from every site, there's also multiple artists every year. Wow. So four different artists um, each year, 400 cases that we make each year, 100, 100 for each artist. Yeah, so beautiful. He'll, 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 he has another label lined up for a couple of years from now, but I've, I've been working with a bunch of different people to, to do labels. That, that's, a, that's awesome, man. Did you have some port or? Did, no, no. You want to pour some? Yeah, might as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, so like you know, we can't really label it as anything because it's every single block. Yeah, do, do, what do you call it? You call in, that a blend? Like it's a, a blend, yeah. but it's kind of like a state blend, really, because it's yeah. it is a state fruit, uh, technically, because it's all from our stuff that we own. Yeah. Uh, but it's a weird. There, you couldn't. You couldn't label it any particular thing because it's we, we grow thirty different varieties. So, do you grow do you grow any other fruits? Uh, I have uh, olives. I have olive trees. Oh wow! I have apples. So we do a cider in a can. Yeah. I have about 40, uh, 40 apple trees. Um, of course, we have um, the orchard next to Judas Vineyard. We have figs, pe uh, pears, apple, apricot, plum pomegranate, mulberries. Any mulberry wine? No, we just we usually take those we usually take those fresh ones and uh, put them on the salads at the uh, okay. at the Osteria. Do you want to pour it? Surely. Insanity. Calvin was totally hoping not for me to ask to pour that because he's like I've got like two bottles of this, you know, left for this particular artist. So, it's rare. I got the look. I don't even know Calvin, I, but I feel like you know I got trade the look. Him, trade him a beaver for it. <laughs> you want some beaver butt juice? I I've got access. You know a guy, huh? I know a guy. Yeah. So it's always it's always interesting. You're you're so focused to to put together like. A single variety in a bottle and a showcase of thing, and I think that's important for a new region to really show you. Here's how we do an Alianico. Here's how we do a Sangiovese or Sagrantino. But I think when you start bringing all those grapes together, because you're not sure where to go with your blends uh, in your state, you can put a bunch of things together, and it comes out like this. Yeah, I think it's it's just indicative of like you're just growing some pretty solid fruit. Do you do you draw any like uh, musical comparisons? With your genre to uh, Arizona wine at all? I haven't really thought about that. As far as writing process, you know, everything creative is, is similar, but uh, yeah, Arizona, I don't know. Because if you think about like, let's just take the the Grammys for example, you know, why? As as a well, that's where I was going with it. That's where <laughs> I was going with this. As like a hard rock heavy metal fan. Yeah. I feel like the genre that I love uh, never gets any yeah. appreciation. None. And so, like, so, like, if you look at mainstream wine in Arizona, you know, some similarities there. Yeah, definitely, because I think it's it's not so much that people are lazy; it's that there's there's just only so much information you can process. So for us to go, there's a new wine region. Like, fuck, another one. Like now they got to deal with like getting your head around this thing. Yeah. There's no. There's no now they got to print new psalm cards to include notes on a grape in a region that have no idea what mm. it is or what it expresses. That's a that's a tall order for for anybody. But but some of that's on the state too. So like yeah. when when I was when I was covering wine, Idaho, Virginia, New York, uh, even uh, Missouri, uh, were all like calling me. Fly, offering to fly me out. Yes, doing Missouri, all Missouri. No offense to Missouri, they were behind the wine. Yeah. Uh, I wish that Missouri's 
energy was behind Arizona wine because I feel like, again, no offense to Missouri wines, there's not a lot of follow through on the actual wine in Missouri. The only thing they got going for them is the Norton grape. Yes. You know, so they have the, yes. you know, the only true American grape. That's about it. Yeah. But yeah, you're, you're right. It's, um, it's a, when you can grow things like this in this area, if mm-hmm. you can grow Sagrantino and Chazal and Alianico and Sangiovese and Barbera, if you can grow those things in an area well and go toe to toe with an established region like California or Oregon or Finger Lakes, but Arizona, the state, their agriculture department should be like, Behind. what do you need? Yes. They should be calling you every single day. Like, yes. how can we promote you? Yes. What can we do to bring tourists out? You know, and it, not just not just your your vineyard, but like the entire state. Right. Well, part of what I'm building here is to help nudge that in that direction because it's like you have to you have to put it in front of their nose. There's a yeah. there's a college nearby, uh, the Avapai College, has a Clarkdale campus, and we, we tried to start a wine, you know, like a, an actual wine growing and wine making program there, and they were resistant forever. And I got the college to allow me to plant an acre of vines right next to the facility that was a racquetball court, which is now a functioning teaching facility. Wow. Um, but it didn't go until they actually saw the grapes growing. There's, Negra, there's an acre of Negramaro right next to the, that building, and they went, oh, you can grow grapes here, and we're an agricultural community college. Yeah. That's awesome. And now, that, and now it's been there for you know, 10 years. It's been functioning as a, as a teaching winery. Well, I know there's an Arizona senator who uh, watches this show or listens to it. So uh, get off your ass and uh, which one? The uh, no, no, don't don't tell me. Yeah, no, we should probably shouldn't. No. But uh, so we'll end on a good note. Let's taste this. All right. All right. I think this ended up being predominantly. It's everything. There's everything in here. Easily 50% of it is every single thing you can think of. But I think there's Tempranillo. Um, you know, we, this reminds Merlot. me. This reminds me of uh, of a vineyard in um, uh, Portugal that did something very similar to this. It's called Corda de Cima. Um, they're not in. They're not in Douro, but they're on the. On the outskirts, but this, this is taking me back to Portugal. Yeah, and I and I don't think. And Portuguese reds, by the way, like if you tried to pour me a Portuguese red thirty years ago, I was like, "Are you sure?" And then now, like last in the last ten years, it seems like they've figured it out because they were so all the producers were so focused on how you make a, a port. Yeah, and they would kind of throw a steel wine into the mix as an afterthought. Now there's amazing, amazing. Portuguese stills that actually make it outside of the country because there's a bunch in the country you have to yeah have they to drink know. it all yeah. Uh, yeah. but they also have like this complex of like Spain you know being the, mm-hmm. yeah, the, the, there's a whole psychology thing there with them but man this is great thanks for thanks for uh, suggesting that we drink this and uh, making Calvin uh, break it open appreciate that but uh, man it's, it's great having you on it's just great having you on and, and, and chatting with you but uh Love what you're doing. Your music's meant a lot to me over the years, and uh, it means even more to me that you're you're a fan of of good drink. So, you know, this is uh, this is one of those experiences of, of tasting and, and uh, talking with you that uh, honestly is is a bucket list thing. So, cheers to you, cheers. my friend. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. Now, hope you all enjoyed that interview with Maynard. What a special treat that was for me. Like I was telling you all, I've been hunting him for five years. And that was like a, it was like a real dream come true for me to sit down with one of my music idols. But uh, I mean, you're, you're the biggest Tool fan here. What, what'd you think? <laughs> Just on a level of, you know, you can see his passion. Um, I love him talking about the Toir, the different grapes, you know, different locations of making different wines around the world and so forth. So yeah, I truly enjoyed that. One of the things that we did, Jamar, was like we, we drank mead and like I I professed my passion for mead a lot. Do you like mead? I have not had the pleasure of having much of it to enjoy, but definitely something I love this for more. So you like honey though? I do. So honey, man, to me honey is like 
is the world's savior. Like, the okay. more we can encourage honey, the more bees are going. You know? So can I actually tell you something? Yeah. Uh, right now in my backpack, I have an EpiPen for bee stings. Are you allergic to bees? Literally, is one of the one of the few things that like I am terrified of that oh, will absolutely shit. kill me. Uh, but God bless the bees. Uh, I am all about all that preservation. Yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> they, thanks but, a lot, but, Jamar. But, yeah, but, yeah. Jamar, Matt. Uh, personally... Yeah. Great conversation like, here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, hey. I want to be like a... Woo, you have but no we, idea. You, you, but yeah, we, go we've known each other. We've known each other for 10 years and I didn't know this. Yeah, so... And, and actually, if you ever notice, we don't ever sit outside. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, yeah, that's why. Yeah, so... Wow. Little known fact, bees are my... Yeah, that's interesting because the only time I've been with you that we were outside, it was cold out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. If you really pay attention at night, yeah, wow. I'm very, yeah. yeah. Me and bees just don't. Damn. Yeah, but yeah, back to me and honey. But but are you? <laughs> but, but that would be supporting your nemesis, though. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Sorry, didn't mean to change the subject. Yeah, that's definitely <laughs> shifted from Maynard and Tool. But uh, you know, hey, we well, now know. Hey, hey, look. Jamar's our friend. Yes, that's true. You know. uh, on a serious note, yeah. though, uh, uh, Fred, actually, that you did finally get your opportunity to yeah. interview Maynard. Was it everything? Yeah. I mean, the, the thing about Maynard was, like, he had connection with everyone in the room. And, like, he doesn't give, he only gives interviews to, like, Joe Rogan or, like, super, like, high-level people. And he doesn't give people like three hours of his time. And I got three hours with him, you know, some of which was recorded. And well, we have spent time together before. Uh, this was the first time it was, it was me talking to him. Other times I was just there part of a conversation. But this was, this was very special for me because I've been, he was the first guest I was really trying to get. I would get, Jeffrey Wright before him. I would get David Byrne before him. I got Metallica before him. I got Slipknot before him. I got Peyton Manning before him. And I got all of these people who are like icons and I could not get the guy I wanted because he has, he has that thing of like crossover between music, food, and drink. That is really what this show is about. And I, and I wanted to make it more about the drink. I wanted to show people who he is outside of the music. That was my goal. And to me, it was, it was a home run. It was, yeah. it, was a huge, it was a huge moment because you got to see him for who he is outside of music. And we just had a conversation over drink. Music came up, but it was more drinking. It was more tasting. You know, thank you all. Man, it's yeah, great yeah. hanging out. We got we got a couple more episodes they'll be dropping later on. This trio or the four of us will be together again soon. Next guest up will be Amanda Vance, celebrity handicapper. Go check her out on Instagram and uh, tune in soon for that episode. Cheers, y'all. And remember, Cheers. vodka sucks.